Now let's jump right into Mark chapter 8. Look down at verse 2 if you would please. Jesus said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting through their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from afar. Now we, need, we see another great multitude is gathered to Jesus, around 4,000. <clears> whatever, provision, whatever provisions they may have brought with them, you know, they'd been with them for three days. So I'm sure they came prepared, brought some provisions with them for their camping trip. But whatever they brought with them now has surely run out. And Jesus is not only a hospitable host, but he's a compassionate host. All right, he sees compassion on them. He knows they're hungry. <clears throat> and Jesus shows compassion by feeding them physically. All right, <clears throat> but Jesus' exa greatest example of compassion is not by feeding people physically, by feeding people spiritually. All right. <clears throat> Because the Bible says he is the bread of life. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. All right, that was Jesus' greatest example of compassion is feeding people spiritually and healing people spiritually. See, it was nothing for Jesus to snap his fingers and multiply some loaves of bread. That was light work for Jesus. Nothing for Jesus to just multiply some loaves. Easy day for Jesus to do that. But to be able to feed people with the bread of life cost him his life's blood. So that's the greatest example of compassion because that cost him his life's blood. It cost him his life to be able to feed people spiritually with the bread of life. Now many think volunteering at a soup kitchen is the greatest example of compassion. Now, thank God for those people who do that kind of stuff, all right? I'm not trying to take away anything from them. But what they're doing will only feed somebody one meal at a time. All right? It's just going to feed them one meal or they're going to get hungry again. <clears throat> all right? Feeding someone the bread of life will feed them for all eternity. Amen? I believe the Bible teaches the greatest example of compassion is to preach the gospel to the poor. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. All right? This is from the book of John. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Greater than physical healing, all right? Greater than, than any physical healing miracle was the miracle or the pinnacle of Christ's ministry was the spiritual healing of Christ preaching the gospel to the poor. And I've preached that many times here in our church. I just want you to be reminded that that's the greatest example of compassion, is preaching the gospel to the poor. And what amazes me is that churches like ours that go soul winning every week, and most of us soul win every day of our lives. Praise God, I... I about three hours ago, I just led a man to the Lord. I had a federal a firearms guy, a dealer that transferred, some, uh, transferred a, a weapon for me. And I was able to lead him to, to the Lord. Amen. And, uh, you know, we, we, we sow in every week. We try to sow in every day. But what amazes me so often, we'll be the ones accused of not having compassion. If you don't believe me, just go look at some of the comments on some of my YouTube videos. All right, so some, of, some of my haters. All right, how many did we pull out of that ghetto last week between you and between both of our teams? How many did we, how many did we get saved? Was how many? Was that, how many you said you had? Well, between all together, that one, one, one apartment complex last week we hit, I got four, you got four, five, that's so that's uh, nine. Nine people we had saved last week out of the, one of the most run down the worst ghettos in this area. Um, but, <clears throat> see, and, and, and uh, those, those YouTube haters who would accuse us of not having compassion because we preach hard against sodomites, you know, and, and I wonder, you know, did Josiah and Jehoshaphat 
and Asa? Did they have, com- what, I, I, they were probably accused of not having compassion either when they did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and tore down the Sodomites' houses and put them out of the land. So uh, do you think they were accused of not having compassion too? But I don't think they really cared. I think they cared about just doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? But, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're accused of not having compassion but the Bible tells me I, we're, we're commanded to have compassion on our, our, on our enemies. You know, when I want to show love and I want to be compassionate on my personal enemies, but not on the enemies of God, amen, the God-haters, all right? The Bible says you can actually bring a curse upon yourself for loving those who hate the Lord. And if you want to find out who hates the Lord, read Romans chapter 1, all right? But the Bible says, and some have compassion making a difference. It says some have compassion. It didn't say all. Okay? <clears throat> I have compassion on the overwhelming majority of people in the world. All right? I've only met a few people in my entire life that I don't have compassion on. Out of the thousands of people that I've met in the military, and thousands of people I've met in my 40 years, there's probably only a handful of people that I don't have compassion on or try not to have compassion on. That I don't want to have compassion on. All right, one of them's a rapist who was preying on my children. Zero compassion. One of them's a sodomite. One day he approached me and prayed on me. Zero compassion. One of them's Crystal's older cousin, an older man who molested a young boy. Zero compassion. So, you know, when we preach against people like this, we're accused of not having compassion. But I don't have compassion on those people, all right? But I do have compassion on the overwhelming majority of the world, all right? <clears throat> but I want to be known. I want the Old Path Baptist Church to be known for a church that has compassion. Even though there's probably 1% or 2% of the entire world we don't have compassion on these wicked, evil people, I want the Old Path Baptist Church to be known as a church that has compassion and a church that is compelled to feed people spiritually. I believe that's Jesus' greatest example of compassion is feeding people spiritually and winning souls. Amen? And I want us to be known as a church that has uh, compassion for the lost. Amen? Verse 11, look down at verse 11. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Now Jesus could have easily given them a sign. No problem. He could have done a miracle, but he chose not to because he wants people to believe his word by faith. Jesus, if you notice how Jesus was not trying to widely publicize his miracles. Now look at verse 26. Jump down to verse 26. And he sent him away. This is a guy that uh, he, 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 the blind man that he healed. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to anyone in the town. Now I feel like one of the reasons why he told his blind man that he had just healed to go back to the house and don't tell anybody, don't publicize it, was because Jesus didn't want to have a bunch of Benny Chicken healing lines everywhere. You know, Benny Chicken, Benny Hen, whatever you want to call the guy. He didn't want to have a bunch of healing lines. You know, people want to get their hangnail, you know, everybody with a hangnail. Everybody with some bunions and boils and a sore throat and, you know, a bad case of diarrhea, you know, lined up everywhere he goes. You know, that wasn't what Jesus' focus was. It wasn't on a physical healing. It was on a spiritual healing. So that's one of the reasons why Jesus told this blind man and he had healed, go back and don't tell everybody. He didn't want these healing lines everywhere. But also, I believe it was because he didn't want to give these scoffers their sign. These scoffers that were seeking for a sign, he didn't want to give it to them. Because it's always been God's plan to hear his word and believe. In the Old Testament, before... They had the written word of God like we have today. They had the word of God by prophets. The word of the Lord came to them by prophets. It's always been God's plan to hear the word of God and to believe, not see a sign. 
Today the word of the Lord comes by me and you. Then in the then Old Testament it came by prophets. Today it comes by me and you when we use our feet to preach the King James Bible. Door to door, house to house. And the people whose paths we cross every day of our lives. Now Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. That's our responsibility. That's our job. Every creature needs a preacher. Amen. Every creature needs somebody who will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them so they can hear God's word and be saved. That's God's plan. Now, early on in Jesus' ministry, Jesus was doing miracles. When Jesus first came on the scene, he had to, he had to establish his, he had to prove his credentials. So when he first came on the scene, Jesus did do miracles specifically so that they would know that the Son of Man have power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus shows up on the scene, he's doing these miracles, he had to establish his word. He had to have a basically a leg to stand on. You know, he wanted him to know he was not some Johnny come lately. So he, he, did, some, he did enough miracles just, folk, just to let folks know his words were credible. Just to establish his word. But once his words were confirmed, all right, once he had established himself, he wanted it to be by faith. So that's why he's not wanting to give these people a sign. He wants it to, be by, to believe by faith. And then we'll see at the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, that when Jesus ascends up into heaven, um, he gave his apostles sign gifts so they could confirm the word of God by. Because when Jesus first ascended up in heaven, the, word, the spoken word of God, nor the written word of God, had circulated a lot yet. So he gave his apostles certain gifts to confirm the word of God. He gave them the ability to cast out devils, speak in foreign languages, heal the sick, because they had to confirm the word. But now we have the word of God. It's been confirmed. It's been confirmed for a thousand years. These sign gifts has ceased. And now today, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God wants people to hear the word and believe, not get some type of sign. All right? The plan back then was to hear the word of God and believe. The confirmed word, once the word had been confirmed, once the word had been established, God's plan was to hear that and believe, just like it is today to hear and believe. The plan is to hear the word of God from a soul winner, not to read a track, not to see someone holding a sign on a curb, not to pick it. The sign, the, the God's plan is, is to preach the word of God and people hear it and they believe. Now, I love tracks. I give them out every day. They're great for planting seeds and they're great for breaking ice, but God's plan is still to preach the word, all right? <clears throat> this, and this is why I don't get caught up in all this apologetics and debating evolutionists. Because God's plan is for them to hear the word, not hear Josh McDowell, okay? Uh, I've done, I did a lot of that in the past. I used to be in apologetics and reading after Josh McDowell and and debating evolutionists and that kind of stuff, people in the military, but I, I no longer waste my time. Because you will never convince these scoffers with common sense or logic or facts. You'll never convince them. But what, what may convert them is the sharpness and the power of the King James Bible. All right? Get that in on them instead of debating evolution and, and all this kind of nonsense. You know, uh, one of the things I've tried to do is, you know, well, well, even if you are an atheist, you know, here's something you could, you could say to them. You know, if you have an atheist or intellectual type who, you know, you want to try to witness to or talk to, you know, one of the things you could say is, look, I know you're an atheist. I know you don't believe in God. But if, not, if for nothing else, for educational purposes, aren't you interested in knowing how the Bible says you can get to heaven? If for nothing else, just don't you want to just know? And you try to explain it to them and tell it to them, and it's actually so miraculous, it's so powerful, it can actually start to generate faith in their hearts. All right, that's, that's where the power is, not in, in debating and arguing evolution. All right, <clears throat> I had a guy at work one time that I was witnessing to. He was a superintendent's son, and he was 
we were on the same job and we were waiting for some asphalt trucks to come and we were just sitting around waiting, didn't have anything else better to do. So I struck up a conversation with him. I said, Curtis, let me ask you a question, buddy. I try to ask everybody I can this, this very important question. It's my goal to ask everybody this, this very important question. God forbid, buddy, but, but if you die today, are you 100% sure you'd be going to heaven? Well, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I said, okay, that's fine. But listen, even if you don't believe in God, would you like for me to at least take this little New Testament out of my pocket and I can read you some verses? Aren't you just curious to just know how the Bible says you can get to heaven? I know you don't believe in God, but just pretend you do believe in God and let me read a few of these scriptures to you and then let's see if you believe in God. Because that's how much faith I have in the King James Bible to bring faith in somebody's heart, amen? That's God's plans to hear and for them to believe. All right? If nothing else, you plant a seed. Now, you know, talking about evolution and that kind of stuff, you know, I, think, I like Brother Hovind's CDs. I, I grew up watching Brother Hovind's CDs. But that kind of stuff to me is great for us because it, it encourages us and builds our faith and makes us bold. All right, so I, I appreciate Brother Hovind, what he's done, and I like his, his seminars. But from my experience, get, debating that kind of stuff with scoffers is not going to do anything. All right? Now, you can try it if you want. You know, give, it, give them one of those CDs, Brother Hovind. Get, tell them about Brother Hovind so they can watch them on YouTube. But I don't think uh, nothing will convince those scoffers. You're better just trying to get the Word of God in on them. Amen? Get the plan of salvation in on them. I remember one time I gave uh, some of those some Brother Hovind's DVDs before the internet was real big. I gave, uh, I don't even think YouTube was probably, probably just getting started, but I gave one of these intellectual atheist types at, uh, who was a Marine I, I worked with, I gave him uh, some Brother Hovind's DVDs, and I was all excited about it, you know. He comes back, and he's come back scoffing about how Brother Hovind got his, uh, there wasn't, the internet was available because he did a lot of research on Brother Hovind. But he came back and said, oh, Brother Hovind, Hovind got his doctorate degree from Patriot University correspondence course. And he showed a little picture of the house. It's like a, have you seen that? It's like a little picture of a house instead of a big, you know, brick and mortar Ivy League college. So he's, you know, they're going to find anything to scoff at. They're scoffers, all right? So you, in my opinion, you're wasting your time and all that kind of stuff. Just get the word of God in on them, Amen. Look, we just read Luke 16 last Sunday morning. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Nothing's going to change their mind except the word of God. All right? <clears throat> verse 13. Look down at verse 13. <clears throat> and he left them and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. So they have one loaf of bread. But they forgot to grab some extras. Verse 15 says, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye? Because you have no bread. Perceive ye not, yet neither understand? Have ye your heart yet hardened? Jesus is saying, is your heart already hardened? Underline yet hardened there. <clears throat> but it's amazing to me how quick they forgot God's blessings and His miracles, but don't we do the same? Don't we forget how, God's been, how good God's been to us at times? They're worried that they forgot the bread and they only have one loaf. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? We only have one loaf of bread. And they forgot that Jesus was the one-man Marita bread factory. I mean, he had just created 4,000. He had just fed 4,000. And, and previous to that, he fed another 5,000. And they're worried because they only have one loaf. And as a result of them worried because they forgot to grab some more, like all of a sudden Jesus just lost all of his power. You know, all of a sudden, Jesus now, now Jesus is asleep on the throne. He's not in charge anymore. So uh, Jesus was like, is your heart hardened this quick? Did you forget that I just provided for you? Did you forget that I just took care of you? Are you hardened that quick? But let me say that when we worry, and we're fearful, and we're unbelieving, 
and we're fretting about how God's going to take care of us, that is a symptom of a hard heart. Now, I realize fear is a legitimate struggle for some. And I know people that fear absolutely grips their soul on a daily basis. But we need to realize that in Revelation 21 verse 8, fear in unbelieving is listed in the same list as the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and adulterers and liars. So the first step to overcome this thing about fear is to realize that it's sin. It's sinful to the only person you're supposed to, the only good fear that's not sin is to fear Jesus Christ. Amen? And fear God the Father. That's the only good type of sin, a fear that you can have in your life. Anything other than that is sin. It's sinful, and it's a symptom of a hard heart, and it's in the same list as whoremongers and murderers and abominable and sorcerers. And the first step to overcome it is to realize it's a sin and confess it is sin and ask God to help you with it. Amen? And I know it's a legitimate struggle. Um, I wrestle with a lot of things. I struggle with a lot of things, but that's really not one of the things that I, that I, that I struggle with a lot. Now, I do struggle with it some, but uh, that's not one of my big struggles. I, gotta, I could give you a whole list of other things I struggle with, but, but I know people that seriously struggle with this thing of fe being fearful and unbelieving, and it's sinful. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not, and do ye not remember when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they say, said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? How is it that you do not understand um, this, pair, this issue he was talking about, about how this the Pharisees, be, be, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and beware of the leaven of Herod. I'm not going to get much into that tonight. I'm actually going to be touching, preaching on that uh, Sunday evening. So I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on and kind of come back and touch on that a little bit. But we see Jesus reminds him about the great miracle that he just did. How is it that you do not understand? You know, he reminds him of the great miracle. All right. Now let me talk about this miracle a little bit. This, this, the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. Now, this is a totally different miracle than the feeding of the 5,000 that we looked at a couple chapters ago. Or was it, was it chapter 5 or chapter 6? I don't remember. Does anybody remember? But here recently we just looked at it. I think it was chapter 6. It was chapter six. <clears throat> but a lot of people confuse these two miracles. This has actually been said to be one of Jesus' most... Un I've heard it said that this is one of Jesus' most un recognized miracles because so many people confuse these two but this is a totally different miracle this is not a duplicate miracle here but if you'll notice if you study this out the second time Jesus had more to work with he had seven loaves but he fed fewer people he only fed 4,000 now the last time we saw this miracle Jesus had less loaves to work with. He only had five loaves. They're probably more like biscuits. I don't see this young boy walking around with five huge loaves of bread. These are probably more like little barley biscuits. All right. <clears throat> but the last time we saw this miracle in chapter 6, he had less loaves. He had five loaves, but he fed more people. He fed 5,000. So we see oftentimes God does more with less and he reminds us again in chapter 7, we just looked at it earlier, and again, I think it was chapter 6, it may have been chapter 5, I'm pretty sure it's chapter 6. And uh, we just saw this, and he's reminding of us again already, because God constantly wants us to be reminded, and by the way, the feeding of the 5,000 was the only miracle, other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's actually the specific miracle that's mentioned in every four, all four Gospels, all right? <clears throat> So we're reminded again that little is much when God is in it. He wants us to constantly be reminded 
that he can do more with less oftentimes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. <clears throat> See, this is good news for people who feel like, well, I don't have much to offer God. The fact that God chooses the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, to do great and mighty things. That's good news for people who say, I don't have much to offer God. I don't have much talent. I don't have a great speaking ability. Guess what? God specializes in using people like that. Amen? God specializes in taking 32,000 men that were with, gathered with Gideon and whittling, whittling them down to 300 so he can get the victory when they defeat the Amalekites and the Midianites who were as grasshoppers in number. And he had a great victory and a great defeat with little 300 people against an innumerable army. The Bible says the camels, they couldn't even count the camels of those armies. And God got a great victory because God specializes in doing great things with small things. Amen. But the key is they gave all. They gave all they had. The little boy gave all of his five biscuits to Jesus. The little boy said, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, use me, God. You can have all I have to offer. <clears throat> Take everything I have, Lord. And the Lord made up the difference of what he lacked. Amen. The disciples also gave all they had. The key, the disciples gave all seven of, the, of their loaves. They gave all they had. The key is not ability, but availability. Look down at verse 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he, if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. This is the first real tree camouflage in the Bible. Amen. First real tree camouflage we see men walking look like trees. All right, verse 25. And after that he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Now look, Jesus, Jesus could have just healed him without the spit. Do you think Jesus needed to spit? I don't, there's no medicinal value in, in Jesus' spit, all right? What I believe Jesus was showing us here is a picture. Uh, Jesus spit and he made like a salve. Is that how you say it? Salve? Salve? Like a, something you could rub. Rub on something. Like an ointment or a salve. All right? Um, because here's the reason why. Jesus wanted to, wanted to uh, give us a picture of the fact that if you, if you want your eye, the scales removed off of your eyes, if you want to be saved, amen, if you want the scales removed off of your eyes, if you want to be able to say, once I was blind, but now I see, praise God. If you want to have, if you want to have a, a spiritual healing, okay, once I was blind, but now I see, you're going to have to have something applied. Amen? You're going to have to have something applied. You're going to have to have the blood of a spotless lamb applied to the doorpost of your heart. Amen? In order to have the scales removed from your eyes, you're going to have to have something applied, and it's called the blood of Jesus. I believe that's what he's picturing here. But I think there's also another picture here, is the fact that people progress, once the, blind, the scales have been removed off their eyes, people progress at different rates. Now, this guy immediately, he got the scales removed off his eyes, immediately. All right? Picture of being saved immediately. One washing of the blood of Jesus is all it takes, amen? One application of the blood of Jesus is all it takes. The scales are removed. But didn't it take a little while for him to see clearly? He didn't see clearly right away. It took him a little while. We don't know how long it took, but we know it took a little while. All right? And when I first got saved, it took me a little while to see clearly. When I first got saved, I was still drinking beer. It took me, it took a little while to get off of that. When I first got saved, I was reading the first Bible I ever read through was the New American Standard Bible. It took me a little while to get off of that. When I first got saved, uh, I got saved on the King James, though. But then I, had some, I got one of those one-year Bibles, and I started trying to read through the one-year Bible, uh, New American Standard. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, when I first got saved, I was in the Christian rock and roll. And I, I used to listen to this one band called Christ Afari. 
Christian reggae. But look, it took me a little while to it took me a little while to get off of that. Amen. It took me a little while to see clearly. And guess what? I'm still trying to see clearly on some things. Guess what? I still haven't arrived. Guess what? I'm still a work in progress. Amen. Now I see through a glass darkly, but one day face to face I'll see clearly with Jesus when I, when I stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. So give people some growing room when they get saved. Cut them a little slack. Uh, let God uh, deal with them in, the, in their timing, in His timing. Let God deal with them on His timing. Amen. And let people progress and grow. Give them a little breathing room, a little growing room. Amen. It'll take a little while for them to see clearly on some things. Amen. Look at verse 34. And when He had called the people unto Him with His disciples also... He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I'll be honest with you. I believe this is one of the more difficult passages of Scripture to understand. And it's a favorite of the Lordship salvation crowd. They say you have to turn from your sins and make Jesus the Lord of your life in order to be saved. You turn from all your sins in order to be saved. And they'll use this verse because they'll say, oh, you've got to lose your life. In order to save your life, in order to be saved, you've got to completely lose your life in Jesus Christ. Well, you know, and like I say, the Lordship Salvation crowd says, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. But if that's the case, I'm not saved. Because I'm still trying to make Jesus Lord of my life. And I'm still trying to turn from some sins. So I, 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 guess, I just guess I'm not saved. But that's not the case, my friend. All right. Now, there may be some debate about what this verse actually does mean. But I'll tell you, guarantee, take it to the bank, and draw some interest on it, what it doesn't mean, all right? It doesn't mean, it's not saying that you have to lose your life or totally surrender to Jesus Christ in order to be saved. If that was true, then John 3, 16 is a lie, and the Apostle Paul is a false prophet because he lied to the Filipino jailer, I mean the Philippian jailer, Philippi, the Filipino prison guard, he lied to that Filipino prison guard and told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in the house. If you had to do anything else other than that, Apostle Paul's a false prophet. And we might as well just throw a Bible away, the New Testament, because he wrote the majority of it anyway. Let's just throw it all away. Praise God, I know one thing. You have to always interpret gray scripture by clear scripture, right? John 3, 16 is pretty clear to me. Acts 16, 31 is pretty clear to me. Amen? Uh, Romans 10, 9 is pretty clear to me. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion about what this verse is talking about here. Verse 34, all right, says, uh, let's... Let's read it again. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after... Okay, stop right there. All right. What I was trying to do is I'm trying to point out something here to you. Verse 34 says he was talking to other people than just the disciples. Notice it says, When he had called the people unto him with the disciples. So the first thing to understand this passage of Scripture is you've got to understand who Jesus is talking to. He's talking and dealing with a mixed congregation here. He's talking to the saved and lost. So naturally, Jesus wants to give them both something they can chew on. He's got a piece, he's got, he's got a piece of meat for uh, the saved and for the lost. You know, he's got, he's got some milk for them. All right, he wants to give, he wants to feed, give them something both that they can chew on. It'd be hard, hard to chew on milk, but... I guess he'll give him some cottage cheese, amen. <laughs> Get some cottage cheese to chew on. But uh, look, what I'm trying to say is, is a, a pastor, it's natural for a pastor to want to preach a message where everybody can get something out of it. People were saved. Uh, 
You know, people, old Christians and new Christians is a pastor's desire, a teacher's desire, the Word of God, to try to put the cookie jar on the bottom shelf so everybody can get a cookie. Amen? So I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He's just trying to feed everybody. All right? Now, the first part here is directed to disciples. When it says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That is specifically talking to the saved. That is specifically talking to the disciples. All right, because he wants them to follow him. This has got nothing to do with salvation. This has got something to do with discipleship. This has got something to do with following Jesus. And how do we follow Jesus? How do we follow Jesus? If you're not fishing, you're not following, right? So if any man follow, if any man follow me, I'll make him a fishers of men. So how do we follow Jesus? By fishing, by soul winning, amen? This is how you deny yourself. Because if, if you wanted to, um, for whosoever come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So when, to follow Jesus and go soul winning, oftentimes you have to deny yourself. Oftentimes it's Sunday afternoon, I've preached two sermons, I've worked 60 hours. On top of that, I, I've, I've done probably 30 hours of sermon preparation. Sometimes I don't feel like going soul winning on Sunday afternoon. That's my only day off. The only time I really have any time to do anything is Sunday afternoon. But I have to deny myself because I want to follow Jesus. I want to fish for men. Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And I have to tell myself, no, you're going because you're a follower. You're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're going to go. So I have to deny myself and take up my cross. Now, one of the greatest things Pastor Keith Bell ever taught me is the cross is something you volunteer for. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I I have to pick up my cross daily because I have cancer. Now, my heart goes out to you, but your cancer is not your cross. Because the cross is something you have to volunteer for. Jesus volunteered the cross to lay his life down. Amen? No man took his life away from him. He laid it down. He volunteered for the cross. Your and my cross as a follower of Jesus Christ is something that we volunteer for. We volunteer to go out soul winning when it's hot. We deny ourselves. We deny our flesh. Who wants to go take it easy and go kick back and watch a you know, YouTube video or whatever, sit in the AC and relax. We have to deny ourselves. Amen. Take up our cross and follow him. This verse is talking to the saved. All right. Now, in order to find out what the rest of this is talking about, we got to look at the context. We got to look at the context. Look at verse 31. So we, we saw a cookie that Jesus just gave to the saved, encouraging them to deny themselves, their selves and follow him and go soul winning. That's what I believe this is teaching. All right? Take up the cross or, or whatever it is they have to volunteer. Maybe their cross is persecution. Whatever it is they, they had to volunteer for. The cross is what we volunteer for in our lives to follow Jesus. All right? But in order to find out what what he's dealing with here in the rest of these verses, we're going to have to look at the context where it says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and gospel's sake, the same shall save it. What is this talking about? What is this talking about here? Let's look at the context in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So what's the theme here? The theme is suffering. The theme is rejection. The theme is being killed. So would you agree with me that the theme here or the context here is persecution? Everybody see that? All right, now let's fast forward to chapter 9, verse 1. Now, this is a continuation. Just know that when they put these numbers in here to divide these chapters up, those, that's not in, inspired. All right, I believe the Lord had probably had his hand on some of it, but uh, it's a continuation. All right, chapter 9, verse 1 is just a continuation. It's just a run-on, a continuation of what the context here is. So let's look at chapter 9, verse 1 to see the rest of the context. See, other example of the context. Chapter 9, verse 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death 
till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, Jesus, what is Jesus talking about here? Again, he's talking about tasting death. He's still in the context of persecution. Because, look, if someone would not taste death, if some standing here would not taste death, would not be persecuted, and that means some would be, right? All right, so the context here is persecution. The context here is that some would taste death and some would become a martyr. Now, we've got verse 31, and then we've got chapter 9, verse 1, and in between that, there's a lot of teaching that Jesus was teaching them that we don't know about. So it seems like to me that Jesus' focus here was preparing them for the coming persecution. All right, the context here is persecution. We don't, again, we don't know everything that Jesus taught in between there because the Bible says the worlds couldn't even contain all the books, you know, that Jesus taught. There's just so much information. We couldn't, the worlds couldn't even hold it all. All right. But look, the bottom line is sandwiched right in the, tweet, in the middle of verse 31. Jesus' persecution. And chapter 9, verse 1, the disciples' persecution. Sandwiched right in the middle of that, we have this statement. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. Now I believe what Jesus is telling them here is, look, persecution's coming. Persecution's coming. If you believe on me, and somebody finds out about it, you're risking the possibility of becoming a martyr. If you, if you lose your life, all right, <clears throat> let me, uh, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. So what he's saying here is, look, whosoever shall lose his life, if you're willing to believe on me, and in the face of martyrdom, in the face of persecution, because you may actually get killed. If you believe on me, you may actually get killed if somebody finds out about it. And if you do that, if you believe on me, you're gonna, you, you could possibly lose your life here. But guess what? You secured your life on all, for all eternity. And then the opposite side of that coin is, if you avoid believing in me, if you avoid putting your trust and hope in me, because what you're doing is you're saving your life. You're preserving your physical life. Because you're scared, if I believe in Jesus, if I trust in Jesus, somebody may find out, and I may be marked, and I may end up getting killed. Well, if you have that attitude, then guess what? Yes, you're going to preserve your life here, but you're going to lose it in all eternity because you don't believe, you didn't put your trust in me. Does everybody understand? Does that make sense? I believe he was telling them persecution was coming. If you believe on me, you risk death and could possibly lose your life if someone finds out that you're a believer. Does that make sense? All right. But you will save your life for all eternity if you do that. On the flip side, you can preserve your life by not believing on me. You can avoid persecution. You can avoid tribulation. You can avoid martyrdom. By not putting your trust and faith in me, but if you do that, you're gonna, you, you'll, you'll save your life now, but you'll lose it in all eternity. All right? That's what makes sense to me. Now, thinking about that, let's reread it. For whosoever will save his life. All right, so whosoever will save his life, whosoever says, you know what? I'm not going to risk being a martyrdom. I'm not going to believe on Jesus because I don't want to risk persecution shall lose it. That person shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life, you know what? I don't care if they kill me. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't care what they do to me. I know Jesus is the Son of God, and I'm going to believe on Him, and I'm going to put my trust in Him, and I don't care what they do to me. The Bible says, but for whosoever shall lose his life, for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. And the person who has that attitude, you know what? I'm just going to believe and let the chips fall where they may. I don't want to die, I don't want to be martyred, but I'm just going to believe and let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to put my trust and hope in Jesus, and if I lose my life, oh what? I'm saving my life for all eternity. Amen? That's the way I understand it. Look at verse 38. Let's move on. And I may be off on that. You know, this is a pretty difficult passage of Scripture. That's what makes sense to me. Verse 38, and I've studied this passage of Scripture for a long time. 
and over the years, it's just really kind of uh, perplexed me. But that's, that's what I have come to, to, to believe. Verse 38 says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now, Jesus is back to the saved. So, he, he, you know, first he told the saved, hey, take up your cross, follow me. And then I believe he shifted to the unsaved about how they should, needed to believe. And if they did believe, they take the chance of losing their life by persecution. And now Jesus is back on the saved. All right, Jesus has given uh, everyone something to chew on again. I'll turn to Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> now, why do you think Jesus, when he comes back, To rule this earth, to set up shop on this earth, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels, when he comes back to this earth, why do you think he's going to be ashamed of those who were ashamed of his words? Because we're living in the midst of a wicked and adulterous, sinful generation, and we're the only Bible they will read. We're the only Bible they will hear. Is what we teach and what we preach and what we, be, what, 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 what we offer them is the only Bible they're ever going to hear. Now, you have to understand, when Jesus comes back to set up shop on this earth for his thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, I believe this is what it's talking about here, guess what? He's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. He's going to be busting some hide. And he's going to be <laughs> ruling from this book. All right, this book is going to be the law of the land. Right here, Jesus comes back for the millennial reign of Christ. This is the law of the land, and that'll be a glorious day. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Now I'm almost done, but let's look at Isaiah two three. Give me just a couple more minutes. Isaiah two three, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning, and this is going to be the law of the land He's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. Amen? And look, the Bible says that if we suffer, I've got to hurry here, but the Bible says if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. The context there is reigning. So if we deny Him, if we deny His words in this generation, He will deny us a place of, of leadership. All right, and the Bible says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Look, Jesus is going to use his followers who are not ashamed of his word and who are faithful unto the end to help him rule with a rod of iron. Amen? But look, here's the deal. If you're ashamed of his word, he's going to be ashamed of you and he's not going to let you rule. He's not going to let you reign. He's not going to let you have any position of, of, of authority. And look right here. It says, um, we're supposed to reign with Christ over the nations. But how is Christ going to trust you to be a leader over people in the millennial reign? To rule people and hold people accountable to his laws. If you're ashamed of his laws now. Like Leviticus chapter 20, for example. Guess what? Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning using Leviticus. Isn't that what it says here? Uh, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word. Jesus gave us Leviticus chapter 20 in the book of Leviticus to maintain order and discipline and peace. So why do you think he wouldn't do that in his millennial reign? All right. Now, how are you going to enforce the law in the future if you're not even willing to establish the law now? 
Jesus is going to be ashamed of you because you're not willing to establish all of God's word and you're ashamed of it amongst this wicked and adulterous generation. Jesus is going to be ashamed of you, pastor friend, if you're not willing to establish God's law. The Bible says, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yeah, we establish the law. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of laws that Jesus is not, that there's going to be a lot of laws that will not go forth out of Zion because they've all been fulfilled. At the cross. All the ceremonial laws that were fulfilled at the cross. But the ones that were not fulfilled at the cross, the moral and criminal laws, are going to go forth out of Zion. Okay? And the Lord wants us to not be ashamed of them now. He wants to establish them now. If we don't, he said he'd be ashamed of us when he comes. Now let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Lord, I'm excited to really... I'm excited to see what a real biblical government real, uh, ruled by godly leaders is going to be like. I long for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Lord, I long for it. I long for the day when you split that eastern sky, Lord, and the, the clouds be rolled back like a scroll. I long for it, Lord. I pray you'd find some of us worthy to help you, Lord, to help you in your kingdom. I pray it helps us to not be ashamed of your word amongst this wicked and adulterous generation, but to stand on your word, to proclaim your word, and to help us get as many people saved as we can so they can spend all eternity with us in that kingdom, your kingdom, your coming kingdom. We're excited about it, Lord. We love you. We love you. your word. It's so exciting and, and, and refreshing to us. It gives us so much to look forward to. We love you now. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.